So hi everyone, I'm excited to start the second day of MLCon and uh, thank you all for joining uh, for, the, for this uh, session. We're very lucky to be here today with one of the most knowledgeable and influential technology leaders in the world and get his perspective on the future role of AI. We're happy to welcome Greg Lavender, Intel CTO, SVP, and GM of the Software and Advanced Technology Group at Intel. So Greg, great to have you here. Yeah, well, thanks very much, I'm, I'm glad to be here, but I'm so looking forward to in-person conferences where we get you know, the in-person energy. So hopefully it won't be too much longer before we're in that state. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so uh, we, we're going to, talk about um, AI and the future of AI and how you see <clears throat> basically machine learning and data science uh, in the real world from your perspective. And I wanted to start talking about some of the challenges that we see uh, with AI. So in our experience over the past several years working with many data science teams across the world, we saw that one of the biggest challenges of implementing AI successfully is the lack of knowledge and expertise. And this has been <clears throat> a challenge for, for a lot of time, like uh, for the past decade. And it's, I think it's shocking that it's still a very big challenge uh, even today uh, with the advanced tool that we have. So how do, you, how do you think we can solve this problem? How do we enable organizations to scale their AI initiatives for the rate of demand? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting and challenging question. Um, I actually used to work in financial services earlier in my career, and uh, we probably spend 70, 80% of our time just getting all of our data quality, data assets, you know, kind of curated, cleaned, you know, maybe tagged, you know, to do something like anti-money laundering kind of an analytics. And so, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the AI, developer today, the AI researcher today, you have, a, you have a, a, a broad set of tools and technologies, but the, the ability to master all of that and bring it all together into a solution is challenging. That's why I think, you know, the winning strategies is, is to build platforms and move as many people as we can to code, you know, what we call low code, no code development. Obviously, Python is a, is a powerful language to enable that. But I think, you know, at least at Intel, our, our philosophy is to kind of meet the developers where they are and not, you know, not have you become, have become CUDA experts or have you become sort of accelerator, hardware accelerator experts and do all that fine green, you know, sort of programming and tuning really to kind of elevate the, the you into the problem domain. And, and it's not just about scaling up the performance. It's also about scaling it out across multiple nodes or clusters. So I think, you know, this, the skills you need to have, you know, broadly speaking, you know, are pretty broad. And that's why I think this area is still very, very, very ripe for innovation and uh, making it easier for people to, particularly domain experts, to be able to make a lot of progress, deploy their, train their models, deploy their models, secure their models, particularly at the edge, and uh, get value out of it relatively quickly. And I think in Intel, we pushed all of our accelerator technology into every open ecosystem that's available out there to make that possible for you using Intel platforms. Nice. And actually, it, it connects to the announcement that we had yesterday at, uh, at our keynote session. Uh, we've released the AI blueprints at Converge, which is basically providing low-code uh, AI solutions for data scientists and developers, making it easier to apply machine learning on a lot of different uh, use cases. Uh, blueprints are open source, so very like developer-friendly. Um, so we are excited about that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, inferencing. So since it is one of the fastest growing areas in AI, in development and also deployment, what hardware and software technologies in your view are necessary to make inferencing successful? Well, I mean, um, 
you know, I won't go into all the hardware sort of algorithmic uh, accelerators that, you know, that continue to be a source of innovation at Intel and across the industry. So, you know, first, first you've got to look at, you know, what, what are the algorithmic requirements that you're trying to solve? And then, it, you know, every, every GPU vendor, you know, CPU vendor, custom accelerators, FPGAs, it's really a way to allow those algorithms to be accelerated wherever you happen to have that device deployed. And as we know, you know, um, you know machine learning inferencing is going to be ubiquitous in the environment, right? We already see it on any computational device is going to have some embedded hardware accelerator running some, you know, inferencing technologies and based on machine learning techniques. So it's just going to be ubiquitous and pervasive in the environment. I think what also is interesting is it needs to be secured. And this is an area for further innovation across the industry. Obviously, Intel provides that in our server and our client CPUs. But I think is you know, every device is going to have to have a trusted execution environment to secure the model and secure the parameters for that model and even the data necessarily. Because, you know, it just becomes another attack surface for, uh, you know, malware and or, you know, a pilfering of, uh, of the technology. So I think, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, both at the hardware layer, the software layer, the operating system, or the runtime layer to, to provide that secure environment so that you can run trusted inferencing and it's not being uh, manipulated or otherwise compromised. So look, this, you know, this is the best place for you to be spending your career time right now. I've been in this industry a long time as a university professor for 14 years. I advise everybody, including my own son, you know, who's working in ML applied to security issues, you know, go, Go learn as much as you can, absorb as much as you can, take every online course you can and the degree that you can learn, tensor algebra, linear algebra, and the other mathematics underpinning of these algorithms. It's a well-invested time for your future career. Yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, AI is like, it's software 2.0. It's like the future of software. So uh, I'm also personally very excited about, um, about AI. Um, how about deep learning and training? So how do you see that changing in the coming years? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, GP, GPUs, general purpose GPUs over the last decade or so have really sort of come into their own uh, in this space. And, um, you know, NVIDIA is the market leader today, but, you know, Intel, AMD, others are you know, competing in this space. And so um, I think, you know, our strategy <clears throat> at Intel is to give you choice. Right, and both in the programming model, like I said, that low code, no code, abstract you away from a particular hardware accelerator, so you don't have to be an expert in that low level data parallel programming. Um, you know, bring your, get your data in order, get your data clean, get your data tagged with, with, with whatever learning algorithms you're using, and you know, trust that the industry will give you choice of how you accelerate those technologies. We've already announced our Pontevecchio GPUs that will be coming out later this year. And so that's an example of us giving you choice. And trust me, I've got you know several several hundred to a thousand people uh, currently working to accelerate our hardware technologies. And 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 our Gaudi Habana Labs Gaudi technology is already deployed for training DL1 instances in uh, Amazon Cloud. So you can go there and try things out. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. I, we also have a question from the audience. Um, which you alluded to now a little bit, but uh, does Intel have a GPU roadmap for the machine learning community? Uh, well, training, training in deep deep learning as well as machine learning, yes. So um, we'll be we'll be releasing later this year our Alchemist uh, GPUs, and then in the latter half of the year our our Pontevecchio GP GPUs for mm -hmm. deep learning. So. Both inferencing is supported. Look, you can do inferencing today on Xeons with great performance. Our, our one DNN capability, our one math kernel libraries. Yeah. It's already plugged into TensorFlow. It's plugged into Python. I mean, uh, PyTorch. It's plugged into Onyx. It's into every ecosystem that you would want to use. It's in the open source community. We've already put our accelerator technology there. So if you're using a, a Xeon CPU today or you own the latest Ice Lake CPU, uh, you can do significant amounts of uh, machine learning. Uh, you can do training up to a certain amount, depending on number of cores and, and, and memory. And um, and so I would say that, you know, you can do that today. If you've got the money and you can afford uh, an A100, you know, obviously that's a possibility for you, but you can train 
you want a lot cheaper GPU as well, then you don't have to be at the top end of that curve. But again, I think AI is a service, like what we've delivered in Amazon with uh, with our Habana Labs Gaudi processors. Um, that those, that's a good place to start too. You just sort of pay as you go and uh, consume AI as a service, as opposed to having to bring all the pieces together. And it uses Converge IO to deploy onto that platform. Yeah, I think also what's nice, very nice about uh, Intel is that the choice, like the selection, so many different options, just like you described. So it's really about making uh, like freedom of choice for the developers. They can choose the right tool for the right job and get really good results. So I think that's a good uh, value for us developers. Yeah, and we have um, a strong open source. We have a strong open source ethos. In fact, uh, it just was announced this morning, we acquired uh, Linutronix, which is leading you know, Linux kernel open source developers. And they'll continue to keep doing what they're doing, but uh, it just shows that some of the best uh, software engineers in the Linux community have joined Intel to help us on our journey of giving customers, you know, an open ecosystem, you know, secure environments to run your things in and give you choice of what you choose. So, you know, we want to compete with the rest of the industry and give you give you those options. Uh, but really, it's about giving you the ability to accelerate, um, you know, the computations on the latest hardware, but give you the rich software ecosystem that you're already using, just enable it, you know, so that you just need to maybe turn on the flag and get the acceleration that we, we could provide on our platforms. But, you know, I think it's really about, at the end of the day, it's not performance is one aspect of it. We all want it. It's really about your productivity. But I'm focused on what we're trying to do with our software first strategy is to make it just really easy for you to pick up the entire platform, the whole ecosystem, and get value out of it and drive the business value or the commercial value or the educational value that you want to have out of your deep learning and machine learning technologies. And we'll talk about ethics, I think, yeah. in a minute. we got to do it ethically as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a lot about the developer experience and the developer productivity. Yeah, I, I agree. Trust, trust, us, well, uh, trust us to give you the performance. Focus, <laughs> focus, focus on building good code, solving interesting, challenging problems for humanity. Yeah. So we have a lot of uh, developers in the audience and I'm sure a lot of them will be very happy to hear, to get some tips and advice on career in development. So um, as the CTO of a, of a large corporation, what advice would you give to an aspiring developer interested in contributing to AI success? Well, you know, um, like I said, I was a university professor for many years, taught many students, undergraduate, graduate students over the years, and sort of was really one of the best parts of my uh, life and career is um, teaching others and enabling others to go on to have successful lives and careers. So I'm, I'm a big fan of continuous learning. So whatever you decide to do, continuously learn. And I was asked a similar question at our Intel Innovation Conference back in October. And I said, well, look, you know, your, your resume is your GitHub archives and your contributions to the community. So I think, you know, if you really want to enhance your reputation and your, your marketability, um, you know, your work product is your resume. And, uh, you know, to me, as CTO of Intel, I mean, there are bright people all over the world doing interesting things and being innovative. And so when I, when I, some software, when some of the software engineer or somebody asked me to go look at them, the first thing I do is go to GitHub or other open source repos and look, see what they've actually contributed and where they're actually making an impact. And that's that's the first step. So I would say, you know, I mean, some of you are working for a company and what you do may be proprietary, but carve out some free time and be a contributor to this massive open e ecosystem that's enabling the world to advance. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think building stuff is, is very important. Like yeah. have, yeah. No, I, I like that. Even though I'm even though I'm CTO of, of of Intel with you know large responsibilities across the company and <laughs> thousands of engineers you know working for me, um, I I code for fun, not for profit. So I have the luxury since I'm <laughs> thousands of people coding you know for the company. When I want to write something, I, I just code for fun. So I play around with ML technologies. I, you know, a few years ago I had a Movidius uh, you know USB stick that I was doing some work on my on my laptop. You know, using you know simple discrete GPU to do some other things. So I think you know it's important to it's important to experiment and take the time to always you know stay stay ahead of the curve or stay up with the curve as best you can. 
and poke around. So, you know, I was just looking at some stuff in GitHub the other day from Facebook called Bolt, Facebook Bolt, which is an interesting technology. And um, so, you know, I've been, a, I, was, I was a software engineer for 25 years. So uh, I, I love to read other people's code. <laughs> No, that's cool. We, we actually, both Leah and myself, we're both developers. We were both coding Converge. Now we got to a point that I'm not allowed to code in Converge. Like Leah doesn't allow me. Uh, but thankfully now we have Blueprint so I can contribute to the ecosystem of AI solutions. So I found it a backdoor so I can keep on coding. <laughs> yeah, I always like to say you should never become a bottleneck for other people. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, you get you know, my my primary management motto is remove the barriers to other people's success. Right. Okay. So another question uh, that we have: um, What are the main uh, challenges of implementing successful AI initiative in a large corporation, and how are you tackling this uh, challenge? Well, I mentioned at the very beginning about the issues around um, data management. Um, I mean, you, you've, you've, heard all, you've heard this expression, you, know, you have to turn you know, data into information, information into knowledge, knowledge into insight. And then the final step is to turn that insight into value. So when I worked in financial services, of course, they're interested in the value equation, right? How do you get to value? How do you get to some insight that helps you make a better trade, makes you stop nefarious you know, money laundering, Etc. Right. So that, that's sort of the value equation. But the challenge is in any organization, you have siloed data. And this is this is a huge challenge, I think, for, for all of us is data, data, you know, data protection, data privacy. These are important things, but also organizations often don't want to share data. It's hard to get all your data together. Um, I think one of the most innovative things going on right now, and we have a open open FL, open federated learning effort through Intel Labs, uh, which reports to me. And um, I, yeah. there's been some issues. We have an interesting use case with the University of Pennsylvania's um, Brain Tumor Imaging Institute, and they 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 do their yeah. they do their training and learning on brain images, which you know these are massive files, and you don't want to stick them in the cloud for patient privacy reasons. So you have this data, and but your you know your imaging technology and the infant and the learning and the inferencing that they want to do, you know, gives you some amount of efficacy of. You know, predicting something as a brain tumor versus a false positive or even a false negative. And what they've done is they've federated with 50 other medical institutions where everybody does their own learning, deep learning training. But they, but they, when they create their inferencing, they share the information, the, the parameters, so that everybody can tune. So there's an open source project called OpenFL that allows people to bring together that, that those data assets across multiple institutions without violating patient privacy and get, get up to 11% better fidelity of the inferencing of the predictability of a brain tumor. This, this is real AI happening in the real world in complex multi-institution oh. environments with open source technology to basically do better prediction of brain tumors. So I think you know, this is so much opportunity. We're still at the nascent stage of all of this. And I think these are, these are important areas to think of. That overcomes this data silo problem. Instead of turning it into an impediment, turn it into an opportunity with federated learning. Right. Wow, that's a really nice uh, use case. Uh, we should have them speak at uh, our next uh, MLCon, MLCon 3. Uh, we should have a session about federated learning and open FL. I think that's very interesting. Cool. Um, so, okay, a question about ethics and AI. So as AI become more pre prevalent across organizations, how do you ensure ethical AI practices? Well, first, it, it starts at the top. And I, again, I've learned this in my career is, uh, you know, I mean, nobody nobody wakes up in the morning. Well, maybe some people do. Most of us don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to practice unethical AI today. Right? <laughs> we, all, we all would like to practice ethical AI. So therefore, you know, there has to be sort of first a culture and a policy in any organization that they're not going to use data for malicious reasons or, you know, violate, you know, regional, national, governmental privacy regulations, et cetera. Uh, and so, um, so therefore it has to come from the top. So as the CTO at Intel, I have a team and I've been investing more resources in it this year uh, on responsible AI. 
And we actually partner with uh, Fei Fei Lee at Stanford, who runs the Human Centered AI Group, and she's a strong advocate of ethical or responsible AI. So it has to be the leadership at the top, and Pat Gelsinger, my boss, certainly uh, is, is supportive of this as well. So, so it just has to be part of the governance that you have in your company, and then make sure that any data you have, data you collect, you know, that you don't violate those data privacy rules in or GDPR, for example, in the European Union. And you know, it's important that that we as practitioners always, you know, practice ethical behaviors with regard to the use of data. And, and even the inferencing algorithms in terms of using inferencing for good as opposed to for bad. And um, so, but it's, it's a complex world. Not everybody subscribed to those ethics, but if the majority of us do it and participate in it and provide that leadership globally, I think we end up in a better place. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> so we have a few more uh, uh, questions from the audience. Um, I, I have a question related to ethics and AI that I think one of the unique things about machine learning and models, basically AI models, is the fact that we're basically moving to a world where dec decisions are, make, are being made by a computer, but those decisions are basically non-deterministic. Like it's not a yes, no, it's, it's a maybe. Um, and one of our basic goals also at Converge is to help communicate that decision of the model in a way that it will be easy for um, the users uh, to understand why the question was, was made and what would, like how would, did the model decide this is the right uh, answer. Um, so I think it's re also related to ethics and AI in terms of like how the model was trained, what data and stuff like that. But eventually if that machine learning will be adopted in the, in the masses, like uh, where, I don't know, everyone will be facing models. There is some sort of like a psychological change that a computer is now ma making a decisions based on data and not based on rules. Um, or a mix of both. What do you think about that uh, challenge? Well, I think, again, this does fit into the ethical category, but also I think it fits into the, um, and we, we, as, we as a society or a global society, you know, world, you know, have to make certain decisions about, you know, what we trust. And I think it fundamentally goes down to trust, right? So, you know, there's lots of evidence, there's lots of examples of bias, there's lots of examples of misidentification. Yeah. There's lots of examples of things going wrong because again, it's a statistical science. Let's not forget, you used the word, you used the word non-deterministic. I like to use the word that it's, it's, statistic, it's statistically determinate, but it could be wrong, yeah. right? And look, I mean, one of the <laughs> things, if I could recommend one book for you to read is Judea Pearl's uh, book, The Book of Why. And uh, he's, he's a Turing Award winning status, you know, the, you know probabilistic reasoning, which is in the, in the AI world. Um, you know, expert on this. And, you know, I think, you know, we first, we got to make sure that the, the, the mathematics, the statistical modeling, the statistical algorithms have the highest fidelity that we can provide, but it's also got to have some human intervention to sort of make judgment calls around these, these results. And the, the best thing I want to do, and there's examples of this, is, you know, doctor misdiagnoses this and says you have cancer based on some learned machine learning algorithm that had a false positive. Right, that happens in, in by normal humans, not just machines. So I just think, yeah. you know, what I've learned, what I've learned in my life is question everything that's presented to you as determined fact, and look at the underlying cause and effect. And that's what the book of why is about: is really understanding cause and effect, and the right way to think about the statistical wow. models and how they should be built. Wow, very interesting. So, book of of why we look into this. Um, all right, so we have a few uh, more questions. Uh, there is an interesting question not related specifically to AI, but um, maybe uh, uh, it's interesting. So what is Intel plans with regards to uh, quantum computing, um, vision and roadmap? Yeah, we have, a, we have a quantum computing project running in, um, in, in Intel. And it's been going on for a, a while. It's, it's, it's different. It's not using the superconductivity model. In my, my bookshelf, if you can see it behind me, you know, the top shelf's full of quantum computing books. 
And, um, and so it's both uh, what we call components research. So we're doing the research at the fundamental silicon level uh, with, with um, you know, a, a discrete, a, a, an approach that we think can scale to millions of qubits with, you obviously have to have error correction involved, but, you know, we, we, can, we can reach a higher degree of scalability than the current methods used by others. We have an open source uh, simulation model called LAVA, L-A-V-A. You can go get it and play around with it. Uh, from Intel Labs, and there's some articles published about our quantum computing efforts. But look, the whole you know, the world is 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 interested in this. I still think it's a, a long term journey to get to you know effective quantum computing. Let's call it a million qubits or something. Despite other people's public announcements yeah. about things, uh, this is comp- this, this is very complicated. And it's very specialized, and it takes you know a long time to get to the final results. But let's just say you know I like to say that. Uh, physics doesn't often like to cooperate at that, at that level and that temperature. So there's a lot of science just behind being able to build and test these computers at zero, you know, at, at, you know, zero degrees Kelvin. Cool. All right, so I think we have one last uh, question and then maybe some uh, uh, will wrap. Um, So um, we have an, a question. Will Pontevec be supported in frameworks like OpenVino and Converge? Yes. <laughs> That's a good answer. Again, we want to meet developers where they are, right? It's a lot of work for us to support you know, everybody's favorite open source project. But the main ones will all pipe you know, pipe pipe towards tensorflow we've already published ml per early ml perf results last year with early hardware early silicon from Ponte Vecchio again I can't announce the specific release date but um, you know let's say that yes you know, some GPUs are better for inference right just given their micro architecture and obviously Xeon still the number one inference platform from all of our customers yeah. let's not forget that I And then we have our Gaudi for training and we have Ponte Vecchio that will be used for training. So, you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, we have lots of things, NumPy, we have uh, Inc, our Intel Neural Compressor, which is quantization. We have, just go to developer.intel.com and you'll see all of our technologies. It's all free, you can download it. Awesome, great. Thank you very much, Greg. This was, uh, for me, it was very exciting and I'm sure the developers here enjoyed uh, the conference uh, the, this session. It's a great honor uh, to have you here. So thank you, really, thank you for, the, for joining us uh, for this uh, session. And uh, anything else you want to say to the audience? Yeah, I would just I'd say, you know, I've, I've spent my, I only sleep four and a half hours a night. And I wish I could sleep longer, but the Greg OS boots up <laughs> after four and a half hours of sleep and it starts running its program. And so I'm, I'm awake and conscious. And I would say that, you know, look, uh, this is a tremendously great time and opportunity given, you know, all the work that's happened over the, let's say, the 38 years of my career, right, with computing, networking, you know, communications, et cetera. There's just so much opportunity for all of you to do good in the world using this technology and, and avoid doing bad. And so just always go forward, continuous learning, and, but keep the ethics in your, in your right front pocket. as you do things and uh, make the world a better place for all of us.